A lot of people ask me when they're interested in a career in physics or astronomy, what are the skills I need? And you know, how important is it to get into a good school? And when it comes to skills, when it comes to skills, there's, I mean, a scientist has a lot of skills, right? A scientist needs to uh, have analytic skills, mathematical skills. Uh, a scientist needs uh, to be able to communicate, to write papers, to write emails, to work with colleagues, to be willing to travel. Uh, there, there's all these other skills associated with being a scientist. And I asked around, I've, a I've asked my colleagues at Ohio State, I've asked people I've encountered what they think the number one skill is. Like, what do you need to have in your bones if you want to succeed in a career in, in physics or astronomy? And the number one answer, in fact, the unanimous answer, nobody has any other answer except this one, and it's perseverance. I'm not joking. It's not math. It's not programming skills. Uh, it's not knowledge of, of, of various physical laws. It's perseverance. It's grit. It's determination. It's, it's a willingness to push hard and push hard over a long period of time. That's what it takes. That's what it takes to be a scientist. Because all the other stuff, the mathematical skills, yeah, Scientists use, physicists and astronomers use complicated mathematics. You learn how to do the mathematics. It's, it's, a, it's a tool that, you, that you're introduced to and, and you're trained in to become better at. Uh, the same with the writing skills, the communication skills. You can go in just a blank slate, like not, going, not knowing how to give a presentation. And by the time you have a PhD or by the time you're a few years into a postgraduate career, uh, you've given enough presentations that you're going to be not half bad at it because you've had to do it so much. And you will just learn. Uh, but... It's not easy to constantly be learning new stuff. It's not easy to be constantly criticized and critique, which is another thing about the scientific community. It's very open in terms of open critique and open criticism. Uh, I mean, you give up to give a talk and talk about your research, uh, and then you ask for questions. Half of them, half the questions are gonna be inquisitive and half are like trying to tear you down. And, and that's just how it is. Sometimes it's not as combative as I make it seem, but but that's how it is. But because people are curious, and they're and they're they're critical. They want they want everyone to be right, and so that that takes perseverance, right? Uh, the scientific process is not very neat or well organized. It's very very messy. There's 99 blind alleys for every one regular alley that, that leads to somewhere, I don't, I don't know what, what's the opposite of a blind alley, a normal alley that, that actually takes you somewhere useful. This is, uh, this is, this takes time. This is hard. This is long nights of, of pouring over minutiae and it's difficult because nobody knows what the answer is. It's difficult because nobody knows what the answer is and nobody knows what the right path for it is. If you're on the edge of human knowledge and you're trying to advance it by just a little bit, by just pushing just a little bit, by, by trying to figure out some system somewhere, some process somehow, nobody else in the history of humanity has examined that problem the way you have. Nobody else in the history of humanity or anywhere in the world knows what the right answer is. And so, yeah, it's going to be kind of challenging. The tools you need to answer those kinds of problems, like the mathematics, like the analytical skills, like the critical thinking skills, those are what get trained into you over the course of your of your bachelor's and PhD and even your professional career. But what you need in the background is that sense of perseverance, the willingness to keep trying. Because, you know, it may take six months of nonstop work before you get a decent result. If you give up on month five, you're never ever gonna get that result. The scientific community is never gonna learn about it and the boundaries of human knowledge will not expand if you give up. So you have to push forward. So that's what I try to tell young people is, don't be scared of the mathematics. 
if you don't if you feel like you're not the best mathematician in the world that's fine i personally don't consider myself the best mathematician in the world by far and yet i have a, a niche in academic research where i can apply the skills i do have so don't worry too much about the mathematics don't worry about the mountain of knowledge that you know the past few hundred years of scientific inquiry have amassed you'll get there you'll learn what's relevant and what's important for your particular focus and focus on having grit and having determination and willing to work through difficult problems for a long period of time because that dedication will carry you so much farther and this is especially the case in 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 the it's important to remember that you're never alone in this journey that going from a high school graduate to a phd is at least 10 years probably more like 12 to 15 years and you're not alone in that process and especially in graduate school, like you're taking classes, so you have colleagues that you work together. Very quickly, you learn that you can't take, you can't do these homework problems by yourself, and they're intended to be worked on as a group, so you develop those collaboration skills. Then you get into grad school, maybe depending on the school, you'll take one or two years of classes. Uh, and then the rest, the most of the big chunk of grad school is more like a job. A job where you work for your advisor and your advisor plays such a critical role in your development in your scientific training because your advisor is going to be uh, first off you pick a problem you pick a research problem that uh, your advisor is interested in and you're interested in so right there you have to pick a uh, an intersection of your interests for a problem to focus on you're, remember, your advisor doesn't know the answer either. So you're going to get up and talk to your advisor at a meeting and share your results and how you got them. And your advisor will start asking your questions. And I remember the first time this happened, I'm like, whoa, wait, my advisor is super smart. Why is he asking me questions about this? And it took a few times for this to click in. I'm kind of a slow learner that, oh, my advisor is asking me these questions about how I did it because he's never seen it before and i figured it out not him he, he guided me and set it up and he's like okay paul go 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 figure it out and report back in a couple weeks then when i figured out he wanted to know how i did it because we're we're on the edge of human knowledge and nobody knows what the answer is so it's it it, it moves from being a uh, like a teacher student relationship into a colleague relationship Remember, your advisor is co-authoring papers with you. Your advisor is going with you to conferences or, or helping you prepare presentations. They're your number one defender, your, your, number one, uh, your number one colleague. And it's your advisor who's responsible for training you in all the nuances in scientific research. So you'll learn all the background, physics and astronomy in your coursework. But that will bring you up to speed with the very latest of your particular discipline. It's up to your advisor to work with you so you start to get a better picture of where the field is at right now so that you can start making advances. And it's your advisor that, that trains you how to write a paper, how to read a paper, how to give a presentation, how to listen to a presentation, how to ask intelligent questions, how to see nuances, how to interpret data, uh, you know, how to how to uh, critique other results, uh, how to how to work with colleagues halfway around the world in a different time zone. It's your advisor that's shaping that, and that that relationship lasts like half a decade. So it's a very special kind of relationship that has existed the whole time there's been a science, hundreds of years. And I don't think this kind of relationship exists, at least not in this form, in other disciplines, in other fields, where there's this mentor-mentee relationship that evolves into a more colleague-like relationship. Yeah, a senior colleague and junior colleague, but still colleague-type relationship. And it's there, it's through your advisor, through your mentor, that you pick up the other skills, other than the analytic skills and the mathematical skills and the base scientific knowledge, to actually be a professional scientist. 
And that's pretty cool. It's pretty unique. And, and that's just a part of the process. That's why it takes so long because this scientific training process is a very long-term process. It's a very slow process. And it's a very personal process. And I think that's that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's pretty unique and, and pretty wonderful about the scientific uh, institution. So there you go. If you like this video, please uh, hit the like button. Uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel. And you can also always go to Patreon, patreon.com slash PM Sutter. There's links down there. There's a button somewhere around here. So you can uh, help support all my education and outreach activities. I sincerely appreciate it.